Hello, and thank you for joining us today in today's Acceleration Summit panel discussion on health, education, and peace. I'm Peggy Polonis, president of the American International School in Athens, Greece, and chair of IdeaGen Athens. All three topics, health, education, and peace, are interrelated and most relevant given the recent worldwide events of, of the pandemic and efforts across the globe to solve some of the world's vexing problems. Thank you to Ideogen and LinkedIn TV for bringing many of these issues to the forefront, as well as highlighting the many efforts, individual and collective, made towards realizing the vision of global transformation for a sustainable planet and sustainable life on the planet. Joining us today is Professor Jeffrey Levitt. Jeffrey Levitt is an international Goosey Peace Prize laureate, referred to as the Nobel Peace Prize of Asia and given to him for achievements in international public health and dissemination of Greek philosophical ideas. He is Director Emeritus and Founding Dean of the National School of Public Health in Athens, Greece, and currently Professor of Public Health and Health Diplomacy in the United Nations University for Peace in Belgrade. He recently assumed the portfolio for Euro-Asian Pacific Affairs, bilateral communication between two continents, Asia and Europe, based on a Silk Road of Peace and Philosophy. Three years ago, he assumed the role of Vice President of the World Philosophical Forum based in Athens. Dr. Levitt is a frequent contributor to the Wall Street International. His most recent articles relate to appeals to President Putin on behalf of Alexei Navalny and to President Biden with a focus on Greece. Welcome, Dr. Levitt, with us today. Thank you very much indeed, Peggy. Can I give an introductory comment, first of all, uh, about our planet? Of course. The planet on which human beings and animals live and where plant life grows, they've got some basic uh, elements in common. Namely, they have built-in intrinsic systems to maintain their stability. Think of ocean currents coming down from the pole, from the Arctic, and water moving up from the Antarctica or the ozone layer above us. Uh, both systems regulate temperatures by mixing waters and by retarding radiation that would heat up uh, our Earth. Think of the body adapting to summer and winter with its mechanisms of sweating and shivering. If the planet's temperature plummets downwards, think of the ice age. If it slowly rises with climate change, those systems fail and some of them are failing. As evolution continued, tiny mammals began to increase before the dinosaurs had gone. Homo sapiens, that's us, Homo sapiens were better adapted than they are under man, while man did outdo the elephants in Africa. But of course we know that elephants learn as a result of man's activity, elephants are becoming more vulnerable. The way we now learn with our brain and in the current educational structures, we obviously need re, what shall I say, a reshuffling, a new educational philosophy and new structures within our educational systems and new practices. Cold temperatures cause collapse and calamity. Recent heat waves in Greece and the American Northwest, Pacific Northwest, are indications of the precarious nature of life on Earth. One important antidote, I believe, is education, education and further education. Youth always inherits the Earth either, or, uh, they do until they won't, 
either as beneficiaries or as debtors, and take up their position in society as winners and losers. They can benefit as winners in a world of peace with society's support for education. Let me start with a biblical quote. Be very careful how you live, not unwise, but wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Our acronym today, Peggy, is Health, Education, and Peace. I think it would be very appropriate for you to give us a comment, an extended comment on education. Thank you, Jeff. Um, holistic education refers to educating not only the mind, but the body and the spirit as well. It's co a collective effort um, to uh, help uh, these three areas of the individual uh, come together. So developing internationally minded students who are comfortable anywhere in the world and who take their rightful place as global citizens, confident in their ability to use knowledge effectively and able to make ethical and moral, political, social, aesthetic, economic choices is the aim of institutions such as the one that I lead. But though international mindedness, uh, which according to the UNESCO declaration, considers certain universal values, among them freedom, intercultural understanding, nonviolent conflict resolution, is something to strive for. The contextual influence of culture, however, and social environmental factors on human behavior is not to be ignored. Individuals are socially embedded. We are social beings. Survival depends to a large extent on cooperation with others, and usually others with whom similar values, principles, and beliefs are shared. We, during this time of the pandemic, we placed a lot of emphasis on the idea of resilience in order to survive, to help us through the pandemic. But resilience is developed over time and through experience. And Jeff, I know you talk a lot about resilience. Would you share your ideas with us here today? And, and how does this relate to education and peace? First of all, Peggy, the earth was resilient according to Heraclitus because change was the only constant. It was made known in the phrase, you can't step twice into the same river. Unfortunately, this is no longer true. In recent decades, we have developed the concepts of resilient communities, organizations, cities, ecosystems and health systems in their response to physical, social, and economic challenges. In crises, they all have surge capacity, something like adrenaline in the human endocrine system. In these days of COVID though, health system adrenaline sometimes falters and the surge capacity is overwhelmed. Currently, the variants Delta and Lambda are spreading. Resilience, is an ability to bounce back. According to one definition, it is an action or act of rebounding or springing back. Resile entered English via French, resiler, which came to mean to retract, cancel, desist. Bacon introduced resilience into English in describing experiments. It was big the beginning of the experimental age, if you will, designed to measure the strength of echoes. It was more persistence of the sound than resilience. Resilience tells us how persistent the system is to absorb disturbance and still maintain integrity. Our system persists and responds to change, either takes it towards greater or lesser stability, more resilient or more vulnerable. The interesting thing is that to build resilient 
relationships, we have to make ourselves vulnerable because we think of robustness, but we also know that as human beings, we are very fragile. And Dr. Polonis is an expert on vulnerability or human fragility. You know, when we talk about resilience in the context of education, there is really a pressing need to re-examine our teaching methodology and uh, as well as how educational institutions are led. Uh, and this is knocking on our door because schools determine the type of citizens that are sent out into the world who in turn shape and reshape um, local and global communities. So traditional top-down methods of teaching and managing really fall short of developing citizens capable of cooperating, working and living fully so as to ach achieve an internal satisfaction and harmonious existence within a global world. But rather teachers, learners and managers, they have to engage in a partnership to advance learning. And teachers no longer behold and dispense information but rather mentor, guide, coach by asking complex questions and empowering students to be curious inquirers themselves, to be what we call architects of their own learning. So some of the questions that I think educators should continuously reflect on are what kind of educational institutions could effectively respond to the changing social, political, ethical, and psychological demands of a complex globalized landscape? What type of model could encompass the ability to cope with and thrive with continuous transformation? What kind of student could we develop in an institution effectively responding to continuous change, societal demands, and global challenges while allowing for and applauding the unique individuality of each student? In other words, how can young people be better prepared for the demands of living in a globally aware world? What should their educational experience encompass? What habits of mind and heart should they possess? And what principles and values should guide their actions personally and professionally? What ultimately will add to their bucket of resilience and ensure evolution at its best? Jeff, what do you think about that? Uh, first of all, uh, I should say a little bit more and come back to that. Uh, as a systems theorist, I see no difficulty in linking any of these subjects together. Uh, we can think of loose and tight uh, relationships. We can think of very certain relationships and we can think of relationships that are very difficult to define. And we sometimes speak of the butterfly effect uh, because one thing knocks on to another. But I think with respect to resilience, certainly failure contributes to one's resilience. When I was a young man, I found that atrocious. It was a saying by Bernard Shaw, I think, that uh, uh, disappointment is good for youth. But in moments of perceived failure, it is easy to believe it's too late for us, that we've lost our chance at a life of purpose and work. Perseverance, which is a vehicle and a wonderful name, Perseverance touched down late on Mars, looking for the existence of life, which if it ever existed there, it was billions of years ago. But it gave us a dream, a fantasy, and it helps us, I think, to get through reality and the destination that we're we're moving towards makes it worth the while we push through the darkness and we have to push another mile in life there are many knocks and ups and downs and we go on we pick up and go on hopefully stronger and more resilient and i think that three useful aids to the development of resilience are family education and philosophy. They can steer us to a life of fulfillment. A useful dimension to learning is the ancient, ancient Greek maxim 
of know thyself and you will know the gods in the world. When the Times of London asked what's wrong with the world, and we want to know what's wrong with the world today, G.K. Chesterton, a hundred years or more ago, answered in writing, Dear Sirs, I am. Uh, the succinct answer demonstrates humor, man's highest attainment, I believe, especially when he laughs at himself. G.K.C. Chesterton was conscious that if he wrote a lot, he would not be read. And I'm wondering, will we be listened to, Peggy? Another succinct saying is, it is better to travel hopefully than to arrive, which expanded in Ithaca, becoming a challenging poem by Cavafy, who, in Things Ended, warns us, disaster never anticipated, never imagined, overwhelmingly descends, and being unprepared, we are swept away. And someone else who I recall is Vaclav Havel. He told the US Congress that mankind runs the risk of an earth-shattering moment triggered by man's genius and the force of nuclear weapons. What he added gives the answer that without a global revolution in the sphere of human consciousness, nothing can change for the better. Catastrophe will be unavoidable. And we are looking to education to turn around that direction away from catastrophe. Many have seen the needs for a socio-political transformation through health and educational progress. This can lead to more conscious citizenship the global citizenship of Socrates. Peggy, you speak of uh, conscious citizens. Can you elaborate? Of course. A conscious citizen is someone, in my mind, who places value on being fully human while connecting with a higher purpose. One who values human life and the relationship with all living things and takes responsibility for turning knowledge and skill into action to ultimately improve life and living on the planet. Conscious citizenship in my mind ultimately is more a way of being and living rather than doing and is developed by creating the conditions to expand awareness of social, global, environmental issues while being encouraged to self-reflect and on how uh, one can contribute daily to a better world or how one contributes to a worse world or, or stays neutral. Likewise, being empowered to take personal responsibility by engaging in, committing to, and initiating positive impact to ultimately improve life and living on the planet is very essential if one is to be a conscious citizen. So a conscious citizen of the world sees the interconnections of one's own actions and the consequences of these and strive towards, strives towards a higher purpose of creating harmonious and optimal living. A conscious citizen is continuously in a state of becoming really and ideally reaches a developmental, emotional, and spiritual level of being in harmony with life itself. This way of being is naturally and effortlessly translates into action because it's just the way one lives. So molding individual mindsets of conscious citizenship ensures that knowledge and skill are used to make ethical, compassionate decisions in all aspects, career, innovation, service. It's a framework to be taught along with school curriculum, so as to develop conscious world citizens who are aware of social conditions and activate, actively engage in finding solutions to improve their lives, the life of another, or living on the planet. These mindsets, I think, are molded in educational institutions primarily. Of course, the family plays a big role also, the primary role, but educational institutions come a good second. 
So opportunities to engage in civic responsibility projects to understand and contribute to the improvement of social and individual living conditions can now to the improvement of health and well-being. Well-being in the broader sense of the word, mind, body, and spirit. So holistic well-being. And Jeff, since we're on the topic of health, you have been a founding dean of the School of Public Health. Tell us your view of the global situation currently and how to achieve well-being, true well-being. Firstly, when did global activities in health get underway? First, let me say that my thinking before, during, and after COVID is that our mindset, the world's mindset, can be better modulated with education, civic education, and lifelong education, formal and informal supported by philosophy within a democracy. To move forward, the health of the public must be ensured. Today, travelers on the move should look where they are going, check out how many cases of COVID are being currently registered and what variants are on the rampage, especially at their dream destination, as well as what is the vaccination rate there. Make sure first that you are vaccinated and if youngsters are going with you, run it by your pediatrician. We are not yet out of the woods of COVID. There are still unknowns and no place is heard immune. I would also make sure to have the most extensive weather forecast for the region that you're visiting in your hands. But let me say to Greece, in the words of a noble Nobel poet, just a little further and we shall see almond trees in bloom, marbles shining in the sun. But don't throw away the wisdom and the glory resting there. COVID is never, ever fair. Second, we don't give much thought to health until we don't have it. Education is mostly seen uh, as a way of making a good, good living, and that's okay. Peace, if we say break out of peace, it has a dissonance in the English language. Break out of peace, break out of war, no dissonance. Uh, According to the World Health Organization as well, what we have is that there is an interrelationship between health and wealth. Education, according to Peggy, is empowerment for living and preparation for good and active citizenship. In the institution that I reside in today, in Belgrade, in the United Nations Center, the University of Peace, its, its mission is peace and development, with public health being a catalyst for both. And I think that this is very unique and it should be of interest, I think, to many, many people in the world of public health. But my interest started early and is still ripening. What I'd like to tell you is that I grew up in a village registered in the doomsday book go to the bible for the for the definition of doomsday uh, it was agricultural and it was industrial and so therefore i was uh, i was witness to uh, foot and mouth disease in cattle and i was witness to respiratory diseases in miners so i think that that gave me some kind of uh, of start Fourthly, we have to go back, I think, to health committees at the time and before the League of Nations. Then we have to come on to the United Nations and its institutions and the World Health Organization and especially the European World Health Organization with its 38 goals for health. And it was a time to try to quantify, to move away to the God 
kind of uh, like system of doctors and to be able to develop goals that were specific, that could re be repeated by others and move forward. And the goals for children. UNICEF put forward tremendous goals for children. And now we have the SDGs, which are dominated by health. How can we, though, Peggy, pull off a transformation in those directions? Well, I think it takes a certain kind of educational institution and a new educational philosophy based on a holistic learning experience that embodies conscious citizenship. And this is needed to prepare young people to change a life trajectory towards uh, sustainability. So developing this type of education that relates to a new world is the focus of schools like this international school that I'm in that meets students where they are and guides them towards achieving excellence by designing programs with intentional excellence. It's an institution that contributes to a well-rounded society where differences are respected and different views are encouraged and seeing as enriching the community, where collaboration among different nationalities is a natural unfolding mindset and international mindedness is encouraged. So intentional excellence results from programs that consider professional development seriously, well thought through processes that allow faculty to grow also towards an institutional expectation of excellence. This can only happen when processes are in place to allow and encourage faculty to continuously engage in self-reflection about their craft. The teachers and the administrators have to grow as the students are expected to grow continuously. And by engaging in continuous reflection about one's craft, staying abreast of the latest research, best practice approaches, uh, aligning practice to the mission and the vision of the school, faculty become reflective practitioners and therefore lifelong learners. So likewise, schools focused intentionally on developing conscious world citizens follow the conviction that educators not only provide the platform for all students to acquire the skills and the knowledge in order to succeed in a competitive world, but they also acquire the values and the mindsets to make ethical decisions and work towards improving lives and life on the planet. So school programs that integrate civic engagement and social responsibility and provide a standard to strive towards, such as the global goals, giving students the opportunity to contribute to a higher purpose by taking care of things here at home. Such an educational philosophy rethinks the school as a professional learning laboratory where a model of a student develops a leadership identity guided by ethical decision making. And earlier, Jeff, you said something about health being dominant in the sustainable development goals in the time of COVID. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yes, uh, let me just uh, kind of go back a little and just add one further thing with respect to where did, for example, the SDGs start in terms of conceptualization and they go back 200 years approximately uh, in terms of the beginnings. But there is one interesting uh, element in the health policies of the European Union which is health in all policies. And, and, and I think that that is very, very important in the time of COVID, but it's going to be very, very important after COVID. And uh, Finland was very, very much in health for all uh, policies. But I think there is something uh, that is very current at the moment being, and it's been something that's been on the World Health organization's agenda for quite a long time and when I first came to Greece to join the National School of Public Health 
one of the things was to look into mental health. What do you have to say about mental health? I think it's so important because with what is happening, uh, it, let me say it may be running down. We need more resources to be able to deal with what is going to happen to mental health. What do you think, Peggy? mental health during these really challenging times. I think it's been at the forefront of everyone's mind, um, you know, for, first and foremost parents, but also educators as well, particularly when it involves the young, young uh, people, younger generation. I do want to say that it takes, it takes courage to cope in a world with continuous and multiple changes where, you know, human imperfection is a given where visible and invisible threats to well-being amplify personal fears and anxieties. And young people today face such unwavering change and are called on to navigate change while psychological immune systems are challenged and pushed to the limit. Children these days, you know, and always, they look to adults for answers and to find comfort in the safety of their homes and in the arms of their loved ones. But nowadays, physical affection is discouraged and homes oftentimes create an intense desire for escape due to the lockdown and such other such restrictions. So adults don't have all the answers and experiences of safety and belonging are threatened by invisible enemies. But meanwhile, Specialists talk about the necessity and inevitability of building resilience and flexibility in the face of such threats. But as we know, resilience and flexibility take time to develop. So in a world gone mad, we expect children to continue their days without disruption, to do their homework, to be disciplined, to do as they're told, ignoring or often you know, unaware of the fact that resilience is built over time, developed as a result of experiences, and put to the test when life presents its challenges. So when children react to an unnatural situation, we expect them to go back to being normal, lest they neglect their math homework or their literature homework. But in reality, the life lessons and the internal conflicts they face and have been facing throughout the last year and a half, as we all have, are real attempts to cope with and navigate uncharted territory. The question remains, will this generation be permanently traumatized or was this pandemic one more way towards building resiliency? For sure, resources are needed, uh, not only to support students, but to figure this question out. You, 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 you mentioned some powerful things. Uh, First of all, the immune system, uh, and uh, as we know, it's made up of two parts, uh, stated simply, the basic one that comes from uh, our DNA and the adaptive one that we take through life, and as we get older, it becomes more compromised. But we are living at a time when both are being compromised. That's the first one. The other one, you, you, you talk about the madness of the world. I call this social dementia, and uh, uh, education is the only coping mechanism, I believe, with a healthy population and, of course, at peaceful times. And the last point, I think, is that mental health must have a high priority, but we have to continue to appeal in a continual fashion as human beings to human beings in the spirit of uh, of, of the Einstein-Russell Declaration of 50 years ago. Remember your humanity and forget the rest. I think that's a wonderful suggestion that they make. And also in the name of youth, in, uh, and the words of Greta Thunberg in a travel diary, six months on a planet in crisis, I urge you to listen to science and to act now. Of course, she's talking to politicians, to tell politicians to act now before it's too late. We have to help raise the global voice for our HEP, Health, 
education and peace of yesterday, today, which we're doing today, and tomorrow we have to continue with an even louder voice. And speaking of peace, Jeff, now you are the recipient of the Gushi Peace Prize. And I'd really love to hear more about how that came to be and what does this mean to you in light of your striving, striving and education for peace? Uh, first of all, there is no monetary uh, reward to that prize. And second, if you accept it, you have to agree to continue working towards peace. So thank you for this opportunity to work towards peace because this is one of the things we're doing at this instant time and I thank you greatly. Uh, Chance was the big player, helped by a medical dean in America, the director of the United Nations Family Institution in Belgrade, an expert on Islamic philosophy in Asia, and the president of the World Philosophical Forum, of which you've said I am its vice president. My work in the Balkans and my interests in all things Greek were important to receiving that. And I think that uh, in pushing the agenda of peace forward, I was very, very happy to see the uh, Biden-Putin summit in which I see that it's providing some directions and in the institution in Belgrade we have looked at such things as rapprochement using neurophysiology, using brain research uh, between uh, America and Russia and I think this is something uh, that we must pursue. But I like the saying of Dag Amashov he once said that the United Nations was created to save humanity from hell. And I think we're approaching hell. And I would say only HEP, health, education and peace, can do that. And it's a difficult task. But Peggy, you have the last word. Well, it's nice to know, Jeff, that even though uh, as the United Nations was created to save the humanity from hell, that there is some hope uh, in the world. And I really would like to end this session with um, a message of hope. Um, and certainly education is a big part of, um, you know, raising awareness and uh, um, informing people so that we... It, uh, people can make informed choices in the world, uh, whether it's about well-being or peace or, or, or other things. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, it's important to, to, to take care and be well so as to do well. Um, if you had any final words of advice for the younger generations, what would those be? I think that they have to work, 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 and work. They have to tell uh, people like me, the older generation, you're still young, Peggy, but they will tell you. And I think they have to keep knocking on our door and giving the, us their ideas of what we should be doing so that they can have a future, so that they can have hope in that future, so that they can gain an education that will give them fulfillment in life and the means to make a living in this very difficult world. You know, I really like that you said that they need to tell us, Jeff, because oftentimes we tell them, you know, even though we mess things up in this world, it's up to you to fix it. And we tell the younger generations. And I think that it's definitely up to us to help them fix it or to guide that process. So I appreciate that you said, you know, they need to tell us it's time for us to listen to the younger generations. And with that in mind, I wanna thank you so much for being with us today and engaging with me on the topics of health, education, and peace. HEP, the hope of the future. Most grateful for your wisdom. Thank you for being here today. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you to Chris. Thank <laughs> you.